This is Space Time, Series 24, Episode 33, for broadcast on the 26th of March, 2021. Coming up on Space Time, a gigantic jet from the early universe, the planet with two atmospheres, and China's new Long March 7 rocket launches a top-secret spy satellite. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered one of the biggest quasars ever seen in the early universe. The stunning jet of particles stretches out almost twice as long as the Milky Way galaxy. It's being generated by a rapidly growing supermassive black hole some 12.7 billion light years away. That's a time when the universe was just a billion years old. The findings, reported in the Astrophysical Journal, are raising more and more questions about how black holes could grow so big in such a short period of time. The newly discovered quasar was identified using NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory. The supermassive black hole, named PSOJ352.4034-15.3373, sits at the centre of a young galaxy. Quasars are formed as material orbiting around a black hole in an accretion disk is ripped apart, releasing enormous amounts of energy before passing a point of no return called an event horizon and falling into the black hole. But black holes are messy feeders, and huge magnetic fields can focus some of the secretion disk material before it reaches the event horizon, channeling it into powerful jets, which are then beamed out across the universe. The study's lead author, Thomas Connor from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says despite their powerful gravitational fields and fearsome reputation, black holes don't inevitably pull everything that approaches close to them. Material orbiting around the black hole in the accretion disk first needs to lose speed and energy before it can fall further inwards and cross the event horizon. Magnetic fields can cause a braking effect on the accretion disk as they power a jet, which is one key way for material in the disk to lose energy and therefore enhance the rate of growth of black holes. Astronomers needed to observe the black hole for three days using the sharp vision of the Earth-orbiting Chandra X-ray telescope to detect evidence for the X-ray jet. The X-ray emissions were detected about 160,000 light-years from the quasar, along the same direction as much shorter jets previously seen in radio waves by the Very Long Baseline Array. This black hole breaks a number of astronomical records. First, the longest jet previously observed from the first billion years after the Big Bang was only about 5,000 light-years in length. This one's 160,000. Now, by comparison, the Milky Way galaxy end-to-end is around 100,000 light-years. And secondly, this newly found X-ray quasar is around 300 million light-years further away than the most distant X-ray jet previously recorded. The length of the jet's significant because that means that the supermassive black hole powering it has been growing for some considerable period of time. The light detected from this jet was emitted when the universe was only 980 million years old. That's less than a tenth of its present age. Now, at that time, the intensity of the cosmic microwave background radiation left over from the Big Bang was much greater than what it is today, just 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. And as the electrons in this jet fly away from the black hole at close to the speed of light, they move through and collide with photons making up the cosmic microwave background radiation. And that boosts the energy of those photons up to the X-ray range detected by Chandra. In this scenario, the X-rays are significantly boosted in brightness compared to radio waves. And this agrees with observations that the large X-ray jet feature has no associated radio emissions. The study's co-author Daniel Stern, also from JPL, says the results show that X-ray observations can be one of the best ways to study quasars with jets in the early universe. This is Space Time. Still to come, the planet with two atmospheres and a new Chinese rocket launches a top-secret spy satellite. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Okay, let's take a break from our show now for a word from our new sponsor, NordPass, the new era in password management. 
So, I was reading a review of password management providers on Wired the other day, and they mentioned NordPass, saying it's a relatively new kid on the password management block, but it does come from a company with significant pedigree. And of course, they're talking there about NordVPN, the well-known and trusted VPN provider. And so now, Nord's developing a password manager. And as you'd expect from a company like Nord, its password manager offers the same ease of use and simplicity, which has made its VPN so popular. And to me, that really does sum up NordPass quite beautifully. Now, as you'd appreciate, with a company like Nord's pedigree, they take security seriously, but without compromising ease of use. For instance, you can store all your passwords in the one place, organizing all your passwords and logins along with private notes in a secure password vault. And you can access it all with just the one master password, the only one you'll ever need to remember again. You can shop online with ease, with NordPass securely remembering your credit card details. If you want to share passwords, well, no worries. You can do that securely with NordPass as well, so no more emails or messages that can be compromised. And you can generate secure new passwords quickly and easily. And you can stay safe online with NordPass because it automatically recognizes suspicious websites so you don't accidentally reveal sensitive information. NordPass also has user-friendly desktop and mobile apps that give you a level of security that's simply not offered by password managers built into phones and browsers. And the setting up so easy, even if you're migrating from another password manager. I found it all took just a couple of minutes and I was ready to go with all my data in place. And for me, that's a big plus. Now you too can experience the ease and security of NordPass. You can, of course, try NordPass out for free and stay with that plan forevermore. But there's a special deal for Spacetime listeners upgrade to our premium plan. This gives you access to all sorts of special benefits and it's really affordable, something else I was impressed with. So if you use our Spacetime URL, for a limited time, you'll get 50% off your first 12 months on the premium plan. So what have you got to lose? Sign up today. Go to nordpass.com forward slash Stuart or use the coupon code Stuart, access our special offer and gain peace of mind. That's nordpass.com forward slash Stuart or coupon code Stuart. And of course, the URL details are in the show notes and on our website. And now... It's back to space time. This is Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered a planet orbiting a distant star that appears to have lost its atmosphere, only to have gained a new one thanks to volcanic activity. A report in the Astrophysical Journal claims this planet, GJ32b, started out as a gaseous sub-Neptune world with a thick hydrogen and helium atmosphere. However, intense radiation from its nearby host star quickly stripped off that original atmosphere within the first 100 million years of its existence, leaving this exoplanet a bare rocky world similar in size to the Earth. One of the study's authors, Razor Estrella from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says that's when things got interesting. Observations using the Hubble Space Telescope showed what the authors call a secondary atmosphere, consisting of molecular hydrogen, hydrogen cyanide, methane, and an aerosol haze based on photochemically produced hydrocarbons similar to smog on Earth. Scientists interpret the current atmospheric hydrogen in JG1132b as hydrogen from the original atmosphere which had been absorbed into the planet's molten magma mantle and is now being slowly released through volcanic processes to form a new atmosphere, balancing out the hydrogen escaping into space. Located some 41 light years away, JG1132b has some tantalizing parallels with Earth. Both planets have similar densities, both are similar in size and have similar atmospheric surface pressure. And at around 4.5 billion years old, both are similar in age as well. Also, both worlds started off with a hydrogen-dominated atmosphere, and both were hot before they cooled down. But they have profoundly different formation histories. Earth, for example, isn't the surviving core of a sub-Neptune planet, and the Earth orbits at a comfortable distance from the Sun. Well, JG1132b is so close to its red dwarf host star that it completes a complete orbit around the star every 36 hours. Now, being so close means the planet is tidally locked to the red dwarf, with the same side always facing the star, baking in the heat, while the other side is in perpetual darkness, an everlasting night. 
The authors think gravitational tidal heating generated by the close proximity of the planet to the star is keeping the mantle hot enough to remain liquid and power volcanism. Tidal heating is caused through friction when energy from a planet's orbit and rotation is dispersed as heat inside the planet. JG 1132b's elliptical orbit means tidal forces are strongest when it's both closest to and furthest away from its host star. But for the whole thing to work, there's got to be at least one other planet in the system, also gravitationally tugging on JG 1132b. So these competing forces are constantly squeezing and stretching the planet, generating that heat needed to keep the mantle liquid and keep volcanism occurring. And this isn't unique to planets orbiting other stars. We see the same thing happening in our own solar system, with several Jovian and at least one Saturnian moon. Given JG 1132b's hot interior, the authors suggest that the planet's cooler overlying crust is probably extremely thin, perhaps only a few hundred metres thick. And that's much too feeble to support anything resembling volcanic mountains. So the planet's surface will be a very flat terrain, probably cracked like an eggshell due to tidal flexing. Hydrogen and other gases would simply be released through these cracks. Now these findings are fascinating because scientists always thought that these highly irradiated planets near red dwarfs would be boring because of their loss of atmosphere. But this is clearly not the case. This is space time. Still to come. A new Chinese rocket launches a top-secret spy satellite. And later in the science report, a new study shows that people with college educations tend to live longer. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Well, it's a case of second time lucky for China's new Long March 7A rocket, which has successfully carried a new classified spy satellite into orbit. The 60-metre-tall Long March 7 is designed to eventually replace the older Long March 2F as Beijing's satellite workhorse, which accounts for some 70% of all Chinese launches. The test flight took off from the Wengchang Satellite Launch Center on Henan Island. The new Long March 7 is a three-stage rocket designed to use up to four strap-on boosters, allowing it to carry up to 13.5 tonnes into low Earth orbit, 7 tonnes into geostationary transfer orbits, and 5 tonnes into translunar orbits. It'll be used to help build Beijing's new space station, and ultimately to transfer people and cargo to the orbiting outpost. This test flight's top-secret payload was described by Beijing only as being designed to try out new technologies, including new space environment monitoring. That suggests that it's probably going to be monitoring other people's satellites. Called the Experiment, or Xi'an 9 spacecraft, the satellite was placed into an elliptical 250 km by 35,840 km high orbit, with an inclination of 19.5 degrees to the equator. The first flight of the Long March 7 almost exactly a year ago ended in failure with an engine malfunction shortly after first aid separation. This mission marked the 362nd flight of a Long March series rocket. This is Space Time. It orbits the Earth every 90 minutes, at 16 times every 24 hours. And for more than 20 years now, it's provided humans with a continuously inhabited outpost in space. The International Space Station is a triumph of humanity, flying at 28,000 km per hour, 400 km above the ground. Its massive solar array panels are so huge, they shine brilliantly, reflecting sunlight just before sunrise and just after sunset, making the 109-metre-long, 480-ton spacecraft easily visible as it streaks across the sky as a very bright white light. And photographing the space station has become a popular pastime, as Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky Telescope magazine, explains. So in our March issue, uh, Stuart, we, we look at this whole thing of photographing the space station, and in particular you know, under certain circumstances. But the thing with the space station is that if you're getting a camera with, say, a telephoto lens onto it, because it's, it's, it's very small. I mean, when you look at it from the ground with the naked eye, it's just a big 
light in the sky, right? But when you want to sort of zoom in on it with a, with a uh, telephoto lens or a telescope, then um, you'll you can find see the modules. Really, you can actually see the modules, well, you, yeah. You can see the modules, but it's really small. It is really small. Mm. So you need... You need a fairly good magnification to see it. And because you've got a good magnification to see it, it means that it zips through your field of view very quickly because the higher your magnification, generally speaking, the narrower your field of view. So the thing will zip through very, very quickly. So there's that. You've got to try and either snap it at just exactly the right moment or take a series of frames, a fraction of a second apart, and try and catch it on one of them. Or you've got to have a, a, a telescope or, or a mount system that will move, that you can actually get it to track and follow the space station, which is not the easiest thing to do, but can be done. In our magazine, we actually look at a particular instance of how to photograph it, and that is when the space station goes in front of the moon or goes in front of the sun, right? So this is even a little bit trickier still because everything's got a lot up right. I mean, you can go out and see the space station. Maybe it's out there tonight and it's just moving through the sky with the background stars and everything. But you've got to be in the right spot at the right time if you want to see it move in front of the moon or the sun. And of course, if you're going to try and do anything imaging with the sun, you've got to have the, the standard safe solar. Never look directly at the sun, folks. Don't look directly at the sun. Don't look at the sun through any sort of optical instrument, even if it's a viewfinder in your camera. Just don't look at the sun. So you can line up cameras and things indirectly by uh, on the sun. And there are special solar filters you can buy from special shops, but don't try any of the, the homegrown solar filter stuff. It, it doesn't work. It's dangerous. So anyway, yes, there are, um, as you mentioned, websites that will tell you when the space station is up and can be visible tonight. But there's some special apps you can get that will tell you when it will pass in front of the sun or the moon as seen from your location. Or it'll tell you, well, it's not going to be seen from your location tonight, but 50 miles away, if you want to go over there, you'll be able to see it go in front of the moon. And then it'll go straight through. You sort of line up your camera or your telephoto lens or your telescope. So you've got the moon there in, in view. The space station will zip through very, very quickly. So you've got to basically take a whole series of frames, a fraction of a second apart, and hope that you catch it on one or two or three. There's an Aussie fellow called Dylan O'Donnell who made headlines around the world with a brilliant photo of this. We've got it in the magazine of the, uh, the space station zipping past the moon or zipping across the face of the moon I should say looks, looks really specky and other people have done it as well but you really want a good challenge and you've got a decent camera and you've got some clear skies you can have a look at the information in the magazine it'll direct you to the website you need and tell you how to do it that's Jonathan Alley the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine and don't forget if you're having trouble getting your copy of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine from your usual retailer because of the current lockdown and travel restrictions, you can always get a print or digital subscription and have the magazine delivered directly to your letterbox or inbox. Subscribing's easy. Just go to skyandtelescope.com.au. That's skyandtelescope.com.au and you'll never be left in the dark again. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Scientists may have found a switch associated with the spreading of prostate cancers. The findings presented to the European Association of Urology Congress compared segments of DNA from patients who were cured after treatment and those who went on to develop metastasized prostate cancer, the type that spreads. They found that patients who went on to develop metastasized cancer had many more copies of the AZIN1 gene, which they suggest indicates an association with the more aggressive disease. Although the research is yet to be peer-reviewed, the authors say they've changed the activity of this gene in cell cultures, resulting in a reduced likelihood of prostate cancer spreading. According to data based on the latest United Nations Population Division estimates, the average life expectancy for an Australian is 83.94 years. That's one of the highest life expectancy rates in the world, only just behind Hong Kong and Japan in first and second place, where people live an average of 85 years, and Monaco, Switzerland, Singapore and Italy, where they all live more than 84 years. In fact, Australia's life expectancy is about the same as people living in Spain, the Channel Islands, Iceland, South Korea, Israel, France and Sweden. And it's better than those across the ditch. New Zealanders living an average of 82.8 years, putting them in 19th position, equal with the people of Greece and just behind those of Canada, Norway and Ireland, but much longer than the Netherlands, the British, Finns, Germans and Belgians. And if you live in the United States, your life expectancy now is lower than what it was a few decades ago, at just 79.11 years. But it's more complicated than that. 
A new report in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences claims American adults without a college degree have experienced greater reductions in life expectancy when compared to their more educated counterparts. The researchers examined overall U.S. mortality using records from 1990 through to 2018, finding that the gap in life expectancy between races has reduced in stark contrast with the larger racial divides in the 1990s but it has now widened between those with and without a college degree. The next big thing in electronic communications could be your favourite jacket. A report in the journal Nature claims scientists have developed flexible but durable electronic textile fabrics that can interact with your smartphone. The team developed the fabric using cotton mixed with conductive and luminescent fibres which can illuminate specific areas to build up simple images and pictures, such as text messages or interactive maps for navigation. The fabric uses solar power to charge its batteries and can be operated using a touch-sensitive fabric keyboard. Researchers say the fabric's been able to survive 100 cycles of washing and drying without losing brightness or experiencing performance issues. They hope that it will shape the next generation of electronic communications tools with applications for navigation and healthcare. It's been revealed that North Korea has used cyber attacks to steal more than $316 million in cryptocurrencies in recent months to support its banned nuclear weapons and ballistic missile programs. The findings by the United Nations was compiled by experts monitoring sanctions against Pyongyang. The UN panel was investigating a September 2020 hack against a cryptocurrency exchange which resulted in the theft of $281 million worth of cryptocurrencies. A second cyber attack a month later stole another $23 million. Pyongyang also siphoned off $81 million from the Bangladesh Central Bank and $60 million from Taiwan's Far Eastern International Bank. North Korea is also being blamed for the 2017 WannaCry global ransomware attack, which infected over 300,000 computers, with hackers demanding hundreds of dollars from their owners for keys to get their information back. The rogue communist state operates an army of thousands of well-trained hackers who attack firms, institutions and researchers around the world, and especially those in South Korea. Well, in case you've ever wondered, there comes a time when even the best paranormal investigative group wrestling demonic activity needs to know who they're going to call. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says some haunted houses may simply be too much for your average ghostbuster, and the advice from the Catholic Church is that's when it's time to call an exorcist. It's a very vexing question which is easily answered, never. <laughs> Basically, you don't. All right, what do they um, say if- then? It's a base. This is a, an article that was looking at paranormal investigative groups, the ones who go out and find ghosts and that sort of, you know, scary monsters in old houses and that sort of stuff. And the suggestion that when it gets to being really sort of uh, nasty experiences, whether you know things get thrown around or there's bad language or something, or the ghost is sort of or the demon is threatening you, they're suggesting that to the the paranormal groups, the people who wander around thinking they're ghostbusters and they wear similar sort of outfits in you know military. Camouflage will never understand that actually. I mean, military camouflage in the haunted house should leave them straight away and they should call in a, an exorcist because this is a uh, suggestion being put forward by the Catholic Church or by some people within the Catholic Church who are the ones who supply the exorcism. So there might be a bit of vested interest in people suggesting exorcism, but it's based on the premise that one, there's the ghost thing in the first place, and two, that exorcism works to remove the ghost or the demon or the bad spirit. Neither of those is substantiated in any way. So it's really a myth on a myth. So really, you have to sort of believe that the, the paranormal, the ghosts exist before you even have to think about an exorcist. If you don't think the ghosts exist, there's no point. So the exorcist it just compounds the, the belief and, and the fear in a way. So yeah, the answer is no, you don't. One, because there's probably not a demon there in the first place. And two, probably. the exorcist is not going to help you much. Didn't you mean? <laughs> okay. Well, hey, a skeptic should never say absolutely, right? Oh, point But taken, the probable yes. could be 99.999% probable, right? Point zero zero one percent but you never know. That's Tim Mindham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. 
Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from Spacetime with Stuart Gary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more Space Time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 